So geologists are the people that study the world around us, whether that's the ground beneath our feet, the volcanoes raging across the surface, or the rocks beneath the deepest oceans across our planet. We're trying to work out what has happened to Earth since it formed 4.6 billion years ago. How have those changes affected the world in which we live in? And as a geologist myself, I got interested very early on by looking at volcanoes. And I think if you speak to any geologist, it's always volcanoes or dinosaurs at a young age, and you just don't grow out of it, and you try and make a career out of it. But you get to a certain point when you're studying volcanoes, like the volcanoes on Hawaii, or those in Italy or Iceland. We're very fortunate in Europe to have so many of them accessible to us, that actually these volcanoes just aren't cutting it anymore. Where are the most exciting volcanoes that we can go to? Where are the ones that we can really explore and unlock new secrets? Well, the answer to that doesn't have to be Earth, even as a geologist. There are volcanoes all throughout our solar system, not just on the other planets, like on Venus, or extinct volcanoes we think we see on Mercury. We've got volcanoes on Mars that are larger than anything we've ever seen. There are volcanoes elsewhere throughout the solar system on the moons around Jupiter and Saturn, with different types of volcanism that we don't witness anywhere here on Earth. That might be cryovolcanism, ice volcanoes, completely different to everything that we as geologists train for here on planet Earth. So I'd like to take you on a little tour of some of my favorite volcanoes throughout the solar system. And I think this has to be my favorite of all time. This is Olympus Mons. It's on Mars. And I'd like you to think about every image of every volcano you've ever seen, or if you've been fortunate enough to stand in front of a real volcano on its flanks and look at it. Have you ever seen a picture or can conjure an image of a volcano where you can actually see the curvature of the horizon behind the volcano itself? Olympus Mons on Mars is so huge that you can see that curved horizon behind it. Olympus Mons is almost three times the height of Mount Everest here on Earth. And the slope on Mount, on Mount Olympus is so shallow that if you were to climb up it, you probably wouldn't even notice the incline, and you'd be walking for hours and hours, if not days, to get from the very bottom to the very top of that caldera. But as a geologist, that's the most exciting thing, right? We get to go and explore these worlds. We get to go and explore different terrains, look at different volcanoes in the field. And fieldwork, of course, is one of the greatest things about being a geologist. So do we get to do that elsewhere in the solar system? Well, of course, there are plenty of astronauts that work on for the International Space Station. And there are astronauts that in the past have been fortunate enough to walk on other celestial bodies, like the Apollo astronauts that managed to walk on our own moon. They took some fantastic images of our own Earth, looking back from that lunar surface, looking down on us from above. And they were able to look at the rocks beneath their feet and describe them in great detail. It's a very privileged position to be in. But not all space exploration is done by astronauts. A lot of it is done by robotic missions by satellites, by rovers, by landers that we send out into the cosmos and ask to send back images. And it didn't start with the Apollo missions either. The space race actually began long before Apollo. It began in the mid-1940s, when we were actually starting to take images of Earth from space by repurposing disused, or unused, I perhaps should say, World War II rockets. So this is, a, this is the first image that was ever taken of Earth from space in 1946. And it's at 105 kilometers above the Earth's surface, looking down on us. And you can see the clouds, even in this grainy early image of the Earth from space. But since 1946, images have increased greatly in resolution. Just a few weeks ago, Juno, a NASA mission that's orbiting around Jupiter, sent back some absolutely stunning images with, with the resolution that has been completely unrivaled. We can see the storms raging on the surface of this planet real storms that are changing in real time that we can observe. And it's not just the satellites that are sending us this data, either. We've got plenty of rovers, these robotic creatures that we're sending out to do our investigations for us. So we don't always have to have real people as astronauts. We can have astronauts in the form of the Curiosity rover that's driving around on the surface of Mars and analyzing the rocks that it finds, zapping them with a little laser, taking images and sending them back to us, including plenty of selfies. But as geologists, does anything really, really make up for not being able to go onto a planetary surface? 
Some men did walk on the moon, and in fact there is one Apollo astronaut that is a professional geologist. Just the one, and he is the only geologist that's ever examined a world in situ beneath his own feet, and this is him here. You can tell he's a geologist rather than just the average astronaut because he is absolutely covered in rocks and dust. It's the dirtiest space that you'll ever see in an Apollo mission, and that's because he was down on his hands and knees scrabbling around in the ground to have a look at the material beneath him. So as a geologist myself that's interested in extraterrestrial volcanoes, I can tell you that unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. I describe myself as an Earth-bound astronaut. I have aspirations of being in space, but I have to work down here on Earth for now. So how do I get to look at these other worlds? How do I get to study the volcanoes on Mars that I hold so close? Well, the answer is, actually, we have a very random but very natural delivery process that brings parts of these other worlds to Earth so that we can study them here in our own labs, on Earth, wherever we are, or you can look at them in your own homes. And for anyone that's ever seen a shooting star, that's a very disappointing event for geologists who want to study these things, because a shooting star is a little bit of a different world that's actually burning up in our atmosphere above us, never to reach the Earth's surface. But every now and then, an object comes through the Earth's atmosphere, and it manages to survive that atmospheric entry. Space is very, very cold, and our atmosphere is somewhat of a greenhouse and very, very warm. So when cold things come into a warm atmosphere, they suffer thermal shock, and sometimes that's far too much for that object to survive, and they don't make it. But every now and then, we're fortunate, and something lands. A solid object lands on the surface of the Earth that we can pick up, we can hold in our own hands, and we can start to tell a little bit about one of these extraterrestrial worlds. Now, unfortunately, when you find a meteorite, it doesn't come with a label telling you where it's come from. It doesn't have GPS coordinates of where it originated elsewhere in the solar system. And the meteorite family tree is ever-increasing. There are many, many groups of meteorites, and all of them look very, very different on the inside. So how do we find them? How do we know where to go looking? Well, there are two ways in which we can do this. One way, and it's a, a very labor-efficient way, is to have cameras that are just pointed up at the night sky all over the place. We've got some of these cameras up on Dartmoor. We've got some of these cameras all throughout the UK and the rest of the world. There's a global network of these all-sky cams. And they just watch the night sky every night, constantly recording, and they'll capture weather storms, they'll capture helicopters, they'll capture anything that happens to sit and land on one of these cameras. But if we're lucky, and there's a fireball event, a really bright shooting star, something surviving that atmospheric entry, hopefully we will catch that event on the camera too. And if you have enough of these cameras pointing up at the night sky in different locations, and you find an event like this, you can correlate your images with the images of other people's cameras, and perhaps try and triangulate where that meteorite may have landed, if it did make landfall at all. But of course, Cameras can be expensive, they can be very difficult to maintain, and access to them are not always possible. So the other way in which we can find meteorites is simply by going and looking for them. Now, geologists love fieldwork. We love being out in the field, walking around on different terrains, exploring different environments. So if you say to a geologist, why don't you just go out and have a look for some meteorites, most of them will be very happy to oblige. And I was fortunate enough just a couple of years ago to be invited along on an expedition to the Australian outback to do just that. Literally just walking around, there was a team of us all walking in different directions for 9, 10, 11, 12 hours a day looking for meteorites on the ground. So why did we go to the outback? Well, these things fall from space, and they fall very randomly. We can't predict where they're going to fall, and they fall evenly across the globe. Unfortunately, with a rather large proportion of planet Earth covered in water, there is a high, uh, high proportion of meteorites that we'll never find because they end up at the bottom of the ocean or on a seabed and breaking down under water currents or being eaten by the, uh, the creatures there. So how do we go finding them? Well, if they do land on land and not in water, then we need to look in an environment where everything looks absolutely identical so that something landing falling through the sky from space will stand out very, very clearly. And the best place to go and do that is in a desert. And that doesn't have to be a warm desert, like the Australian outback. It could be a cold desert, and there are plenty of meteorite recovery expeditions that go out to Antarctica every year, because if something falls from the sky and lands on the ice in Antarctica, it's going to stand out. And in Australia, something falling from the sky and landing on the sand in the outback does stand out too. 
So we went out, we went out for 14 days, and we were walking anything between 10 and 25 kilometers a day, just looking down at the ground, beneath our feet, looking for meteorites. And for 14 days of a 14-day trip, we didn't find very much at all. From a few meters away, certain things you can convince yourself, because you really want to find a meteorite, you can convince yourself that these things are meteorites from a distance. So the amount of times that we all walked up towards something which was very exciting and actually later turned out to be something like kangaroo poo in the outback is a little bit disappointing. But just a few hours before we turned around to come home, I was very, very fortunate to find a meteorite. Now, these things may not stand out to the everyday person if you don't know what you're looking for. In fact, there's a meteorite. This particular meteorite is actually right down in front of me on the stage here and has been here all the while. So finding something like that, if you know what you're looking for, can be one of the most rewarding things about being a meteorite scientist and a geologist out in the field. But that's only where the story begins. Because, as I said, when you find a meteorite, there's no label on it telling me where it came from. Did it come from the moon? Did it come from Mars? Did it come from the asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter? Did it come from further afield? It's only the beginning of the story, because now the hard work starts, and we have to work out where they've come from. Now, that meteorite family tree I showed earlier, each one of those different types of meteorites has some defining characteristics. But most importantly about all of those characteristics is the parent body, the original origin of where that meteorite may have come from out in space. And there are hundreds of potential source regions for meteorites, and we don't know where they come from. It's not until you look inside them that we can work out, well, do we think this one has come from the main asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter, which you can see behind me here? Has it come from the moon? Can I compare it to those moon rocks that were brought back by the Apollo astronauts in the 60s and 70s? If you've got something to directly compare it to and you know where it's come from, that makes it very easy. But sometimes, we don't quite know. So it's not until you look inside a meteorite and have a look at the texture, the composition of it, that you can really start to unravel how it formed, when it formed, and where. So we have a group of meteorites which are very, very common. These are the ordinary ones. These are the ones that even if you're so excited that you find a meteorite, your heart sinks a little bit if you work out that it's one of these types of meteorites. It's a type of meteorite called a chondrite meteorite, and most meteorites tend to be this type. When you cut them open, chondrite meteorites are full of these spherical, round, mineralogical components called chondrules. And that's a defining characteristic of a chondrite meteorite, these chondrules. So if you cut open your meteorite or use x-ray data to have a look inside it without cutting it and you find these chondrules, you know you found a chondrite. And these probably come from that main asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter. But not all meteorites are the same. We have other meteorites that we think have come from elsewhere, maybe from the cores of some of these asteroids that are partially differentiated. Cores similar to our own Earth core, made of solid iron and nickel metal, combination. And these ones look quite different to the chondrite meteorites. They don't have those round chondrules. They're actually metallic in composition. And when you cut them open, they look like they're made of solid metal. And you can usually tell if you've got an iron meteorite pretty quickly, because when you pick it up, it's very, very dense compared to those other rocky ones. And the final type of meteorite, which I personally find very exciting, are the ones that have come from surfaces of asteroids, or from planets, or from the moon. And these ones look very rocky, like this one here. This is a very famous Martian meteorite that we've established has come from the planet Mars on the surface. And it's a volcanic rock that came out of a volcano similar to something like Hawaii or Iceland. Perhaps it came from Olympus Mons, that large volcano I showed you earlier. We've still got some work to do to pinpoint exactly where they come from. When you cut them open, they look quite considerably different to the chondrules. They don't have those nice, round, spherical features. They've got angular crystals. And when we look at the composition of them, we can break them apart. and We can start to try and unravel the volcanic history. These are minerals. These are rocks that are very similar to the terrestrial volcanic rocks that I started looking at many, many years ago. I see the same minerals in the volcanic rocks I find from Mars, even if I haven't brought them back from Mars myself and know that's precisely where they came from. So ultimately, when you find a meteorite, you still don't know quite where it's come from until you start to look inside it. Whether you cut it open and polish the surface to reveal that really striking metallic pattern, or whether you use x-rays and CT data to have a look inside the meteorite without destroying it and try and work out whether you've got those round chondrules or whether you've got angular minerals that you might find in a volcanic rock. So 
So we still got quite a lot of exploring to do, and there isn't just one way in which we can explore the solar system. We'd all love to be astronauts, I'm sure, in our time. I know I certainly would be, and perhaps that's in my future career. But for now, I'm satisfied that I can study the whole solar system by looking at the samples in my own lab in front of me. And these are the Apollo 11 astronauts after they got back from their journey to the moon in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington being shown a meteorite for the first time. And if the guys that were walking on the moon, the first people to ever walk on the moon on another surface outside of our own planet Earth can get this excited about a meteorite, then I think I'm on to a winner. So it's human nature to go to see and to try and understand that world around us. Exploration isn't a choice, really, as astronaut Michael Collins said it very well. It's an imperative. Thank you very much.